Alright! Hi guys, so today I wanted to do a video slightly different. Um, I have not done one where I discuss things or talk about things and all that for a while. So I thought today I'll actually do one and I've been meaning to do this one for a while. Now, before I actually go into it, if you haven't done so yet, yet please subscribe to my page, uh, click the link and all that. Please get me to a thousand viewers. I've been sitting and doing these videos for a while now, but I'd like to get to a thousand because then I get paid. Anyways, um, today I want to do a little bit of a fun video, but I don't know if it's fun. I'm going to try to keep it constructive. Um, I want to talk about these things that I think all of us have at some point is that there would have been some bands in your sort of musical journey or your listening journey that you would have absolutely worshipped at one point and that you may have completely gone off at some point or another for different reasons and I just wanted to do this for fun today just to look at some of them like my top five bands that at one point I was really like I would practically say addicted to and for some reason these days and I will talk about those reasons I try to be a little bit more critical about why I've gone down that route and I'm gonna be, say straight away there's a couple of reasons I'm not very proud of but we'll talk about that uh, and then but these bands you just can't listen to them anymore I actually physically can't listen to them I don't really like putting them on when they come on I'll usually just pass on or even maybe for the sake of nostalgia listen to one song but then that's it I would just it just doesn't do me anymore at all uh, but that's not the case with all a lot of the bands I still there's a lot of bands I still listen to that I would listen to when I was you know in my teen years uh, but it's just there's a few bands and I think I can think of five I was as I was walking w w going to the gym to this I was thinking there's actually five I can really think that I've gone really gone off so let me start the, with, with, the, with the five I'll start with the, the fifth one Opeth. Right, so Opeth for me were at one point, I would say in the sort of mid 2000s, an absolute go to band for me. I absolutely worship them. But my, my history with Opeth started way before that. I actually discovered them first in 1996. And it's gonna make my bandmates from Deep Profundis laugh because I tell that story all the time. But I went to see Morbid Angel on the Domination Tour at the LA2. So if you're familiar with London, uh, LA2 is basically was the London Astoria 2, which was basically the building under the main Astoria, where all the lot of the death metal bands, all the more underground bands used to play in that venue there. It's all gone now because of uh, the Elizabeth line. But um, I saw Morbid Angel there at the, at the, uh, on the Domination Tour. So I was obviously there for Morbid Angel, but I didn't actually know who was the supporting act. And in comes this band, young, fresh face band, Ockerfeld with no beard or anything, and very shyly introduces himself, introduces the band, we're Opeth from the Kingdom of Sweden. And then they launch into, 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 into their set. And I still remember just being blown away by them straight away. I'd never heard a band like that in extreme metal. And in the juxtaposition of the sort of death metal element or sort of black death metal element with the more prog progier side, uh, the clean sections, all of that, I, I was absolutely, I was floored by that band. And believe me, there's not very often support bands, you know, unless I know them, I'm not going to be that swayed. But this was one time where I looked at them and said, wow, these guys are amazing. But what was interesting, which is, I guess, Opeth's career has been very similar. They were pretty polarizing. Like the people I was with hated them. They just could not understand the clean section. I remember right after the gig, they were like, what the hell was all those clean bits? And I was like, well, that was the best bits. So anyway. So, but for a period of time after that, I listened to them for quite some time. Then I actually moved away. I, I, I sort of didn't really listen to metal that much or extreme metal that much. I, I was in a complete different zone in terms of my career and all that. But anyway, around the mid-2000s, I got reintroduced back or maybe mid to late 2000s with the album Ghost Reveries because I was playing in a band around the mid-2000s uh, and the guitarist there was a massive fan of Opeth even though he wasn't into extreme metal, and he told me you should re-listen to Opeth because it's awesome. So I was listening to Ghost Reveries and then I basically gorged on everything that came. So my cutoff point before that was Morning Rise, then I listened to everything that came in between and I got absolutely addicted. Now, if you listen to the first two Deep Profundis, there's a lot of Opeth influence in there. I'm not ashamed to say that because we were heavily influenced by them. We, we dig that kind of sort of more progier kind of aspect of playing extreme metal. But then I would say around the 2010s, I think an element of gorging too much on them and the change of direction of Opeth meant I basically completely in the last 10-13 years gone off completely Opeth. I think that for me the, the, the sort of high point was going to the Royal Albert Hall to see the sort of anniversary gig where they played Blackwater Park from start to finish and I remember soon after that I think I was done with them. Maybe like I said maybe I listened to them too much for a period of time so I, I just got a bit bored and the direction that they took musically just did not interest me. From Heritage onwards, 
the whole sort of reviving prog, pro, 70s prog, and don't get me wrong, I absolutely love 70s prog. Um, it just didn't do it for me at all. Um, I, I, I didn't like the whole sort of Okafell not doing the death metal vocals at all because I thought that was actually a unique point of, uh, of uh, Opeth, that sort of ability for, that he had to do both vocals. So I sort of completely gone off them and to the point where now I don't even listen to the albums I did love. I mean, Still Life was, at one point was my favorite album. I don't even listen to that. It doesn't come onto my radar. Um, it's just a band that I've completely switched off from. Um, it's there, I can see they're still around and they're still playing festivals and all that, but for some reason I've my story with Opeth is done. Uh, maybe maybe some of the comments from Okafell grated me a little bit, you know, when he started sort of dissing the world of death metal and all that, because I was like, well, mate, you sort of were a death metal man, and now you're sort of sort of saying that. It just I, I avoid, I've always had an issue when artists tend to do that to justify where they are musically right now by sort of slagging off on their past, and I never liked that because your past is your past, own it. Uh, the, your past is why you're here right now as well. So you know you have a fan base, and you let's face it, your fan base is predominantly made of metal fans because Opeth, as much as their music is actually pretty accessible now to most uh, non-metal fans, it's still the large majority of people going to see Opeth are metal and extreme metal fans still that follow them. So I think that to me was great thing, and it's also you know the same thing that comes with a lot of those bands is like they'll talk about metal as like it's like a dirty word but they'll be using, using the specialized metal press to get their name out and I feel well it's a bit of a sort of paradoxical sort of situation to be in. So anyway, so that's Opeth. Opeth is one of the bands, can't listen to them anymore. Right, next one, Dream Theater. Wow, Dream Theater man, at one point I was again addicted to them. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe that's the problem, maybe I get addicted to certain bands and then I get sick of, sick of it myself. Maybe I listen to them a bit too much, or I did that, I don't tend to do that so much these days. But um, Dream Theater at one point were absolutely for me the best. I mean I remember Metropolis Scenes of a Mary Part 2 was literally one of my go-to albums on a weekly basis. Um, it came at a time when I was really practicing the instrument very heavily. So obviously Petrucci, oh, again, I was practicing very heavily. So Petrucci at that point was, again, a massive, massive influence as a guitarist. And I really, really, you know, really worked on, you know, a lot of the stuff he did and all that. And, you know, the alternate picking. So the kind of stuff, very often when I pick, I know I'm picking very much the way Petrucci picks. So that side of the influence of Petrucci on my playing is definitely there. I can't deny that. Um, but something again happened with Opeth for me is uh, probably in line a little bit with when Portnoy left the band uh, and I was starting to feel it already I felt that the band was musically just going around in circles a little bit and to the point where everything was becoming extremely predictable and this was the, the, the paradox about Opeth for me you, this is a band that's actually technically meant to be progressive but then their music was becoming less and less progressive because every single song I sort of knew instinctively what they were going to do on them. Um, you know, I knew they were going to, you know, have, you know, it was going to, yeah, especially the sort of Petrucci type song with a heavy seven string intro. Then you know at some point in the middle of the song they're going to push some, so, so, what sounds like a sort of, you know, like, like a left curve and all that, but actually it all ended up sounding very similar because they did the same trick, um, you know, and I'll talk about a particular trick that I sort of cannot stand. And then they will keep doing that and it just become, basically became quite stale musically for me. Then there would also, the other things they would attempt on albums is these sort of ballads and it was just like, you guys don't know how to write ballads. It's not your forte. Don't write 80s ballads that sound terrible. You're not, if you're trying to get on the radio, then you're going at it the wrong way because you're trying to do like metal albums, but then sticking a couple of power ballads in there. That's not how it works. If you really want to break through into a new audience, you need to first simplify your music. Take the example of Rush. Simplify your music, still make it challenging, but you can simplify it. And then you can try to go into more the commercial crowd, but I, I'm not really sure what they were trying to do. So I do find it very difficult to listen to even the old stuff now. Again, probably because I've listened to them too much. But my biggest gripe, and for that, I will blame one particular person. I, my deep profundest is drummer Tom Atherton. He really, it's one of those things, when you get to, once you get told you can't forget it, it's Jordan Rudess. Like, I don't like keyboards in metal anyway. But, oh my god, I mean, and I love John Law, that's probably the exception, but like I remember listening to Rising Force of Mumchi, it's still one of my favorite albums, but, you know, why those keyboard solos, I always hated them, I don't like the sound of keyboard in metal, guitar can do so much better work, and that doesn't mean I don't like some keyboard music, it's just I do not like keyboards in metal. But that's personal choice. Anyway, and then Jordan Rudess is just, his choice of notes is awful, uh, great player, I mean, don't get me wrong, technically so good. 
but my god his choice of notes is bad um, and it's that sort of thing he does every break of dream, uh, of dream, dream theater in the middle will start with that kind of you know slightly circusy kind of sound I know ex if you don't know what I mean just listen to it. it's that kind of circus kind of sound that he starts doing da, 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 and then start, then he go goes into all the technical bit and it's literally the same thing all the time every single time uh, and that really started grating on me and I just eventually have given up on them um, I didn't like particularly the whole recruitment process of a new drama where they did that sort of you know reality show kind of thing it all felt, it felt a bit fake to me um, you know they will in, get those great dramas in there and, oh this sounded awesome but obviously they weren't gonna get them this wasn't like you know some dudes they picked out of the street these were like some ace drummers from like different you know session dramas and all that and it was just the whole thing felt a bit fake to me and it's just uh, you know I, don't, I, I like I like bands I'm old school, I like bands keeping a bit of mystery, so I wasn't interested in seeing the recruitment process. Anyway, so that's for Dream Theatre. So I guess it's a bit of, again, a bit of, you're getting the, you know, the theme here, a bit of gorging too much on one band and just not being into the direction that the band's gone into over, over time. In this case, with Opeth, they changed, you know, I feel not something that was to my taste. With Dream Theatre, they just didn't change enough, just became a bit of a cliche of themselves. Right, next one, along, and I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for this one. And next week I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for this, it's fine. Uh, Slayer. Right, so Slayer, for my generation, I, I started listening to Slayer in between the release of South of Heaven and Seasons in the Abyss. So we're talking really late 80s, early 90s. At that point, I hadn't listened to any death metal yet. I hadn't listened to any death metal yet, so you can imagine that Slayer would have been, for me, the heaviest thing that was around. Uh, I remember the first time I heard a friend of mine lend me the tape of South of Heaven and I listened to it and I went Okay, this is you know, this is a bit sort of you know, the, the vocals are a bit weird. It's a bit monotonous, you know, monotonous So I wasn't too sort of keen on it so then But then I became a huge 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 fan of, uh, of Slayer uh, Because it was so extreme and I felt it was like, you know, and I saw them on the season in the abyss. It was brilliant But I think what happened with, with Slayer and me is that after a while um, especially as I was becoming a better musician myself is I realized musically it was not great and I discovered death metal which obviously meant one is that there was heavier stuff out there two there were better played music out there in the in the in the more extreme format as well so I think that gradually what happened to me is I started switching off Slayer as well because I just found it in some ways just a bit too punkish for me not very tight um, I love Dave Lombardo, so you know once he left, but I know he came back, and I just found that what happened with Slayer is, is throughout their 90s and then 2000, their musical output just became worse and worse. It just wasn't very interesting. It was quite poor in terms of riff writing. It was always sort of you know it, there was an element of sort of hardcore punk that kicked into it that really wasn't to my you know to my taste. I did like the more darker kind of sort of sound they had on Seasons and in South of Heaven and obviously Rain in Blood, but it just I think for me the biggest issue with Slayer is the sort of amateurish level of playing uh, that was involved that sort of just got you know I just got bored of that and I just couldn't find my sort of you know interest in it. I just and don't get me wrong again it's not that I'm listening to always to technical stuff I don't I actually like you know I listen to a lot of bands where not technical but they're very very good at what they do and they're very you know um, the get the playing is exactly what it needs to be with Slayer you know I mean yes the guitar solos are part of the sound but after a while it's like um, come on um, and it, it was just mainly I just found that the music just the riffs were not that interesting um, you know and even now, if a Slayer song comes on, partly again, because we've heard them so much. I mean, it's just like, you know, those songs that like become part of your staple. But it just became quite repetitive for me, and I just don't listen to them now. If they come on, I'm just not interested. I would never put them on and listen in my headphones. No, not even for the sake of nostalgia, I wouldn't do that. Right, now we're coming on to the top two. So, the first one here would be Metallica. Now I knew, I'm sure pretty much everybody guessed that Metallica would throw in, you know, an old schooler like me, suddenly Metallica would fall into that package. So Metallica, right, again, I mean Metallica more than Slayer would have been at my, in my sort of uh, teenage years, the go-to band. I absolutely, you know, we all did, all, the, all of us worshipped. Metallica, not just musically, but also the, the guys in Metallica. We all bought into that whole, you know, they're like rebels and, you know, they're like, you know, we all identified a lot like with the, with the guys of Metallica and all that. We all did. I and mean, we all wanted to be them. Let's face it. Let's not lie to ourselves. Um, 
and uh, up to the Justice album, absolutely phenomenal. The Black album, to me, I'm not a huge fan, but I understand why people like it, and I completely get it. That it's an absolutely, you know, stalwart of the metal scene as an album, and it's, you know, and it, it opened up the scene for a lot of bands. So I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna criticize the Black album because I don't think it needs to be criticized. It's already been done anyway. My problem with Metallica is this: is I think, again, a little bit like Slayer is once you start becoming a better musician yourself and again i'm not saying i'm i'm an amazing musician but once you start being able to play a lot of this because you know we again all learned on their on, on our instruments on their uh, you know on on their songs it, it comes to a point where sometimes you feel they're not really playing it very well i mean you watch lives and you're like yeah it's not very good um and you obviously know who i'm going to be singling out here as a guitarist kirk hammett's playing is really not great uh, and I've talked about that and probably talk about it in other videos, but I think that I think it just after a while it became that, you know, I'm not really finding something that interesting in here uh, Over time the older the more recent songs were just not as interesting I think the one thing with Metallica is that you know, it's Harmonically maybe Metallica is a little bit, you know, one direction as well. Everything's in E, so that means, you know, but James is singing, so, but everything is still is in E. I think that makes it a little bit more less interesting as well. Uh, you know, things do start sounding the same. Um, I don't know, it's a hard one to say for me for Metallica. Look, if, they, if some older songs come on, unlike some of these other bands I've talked about, I will actually listen to them because I do, and I do have to teach a lot because still a lot of children enjoy, kids enjoy learning Metallica songs. So I will actually do that. But um, but I just feel that it's just it just doesn't do it for me. New album every time a new album comes out, I listen to it and I go nah. It just I'm not interested anymore in this, and it just doesn't sort of you know attract me. And again, it, don't get me wrong, there are lots of bands from the time when I was you know a teenager and all that I still listen to a lot, especially in death metal. I listen to a lot of those bands, and not just recent albums, but their older albums as well of those bands. And there's also bands outside of metal. I'm a huge fan of Dire Straits, and I'll still listen to Dire Straits happily. Um, I think maybe it could be like I said with Metallica because I spend a lot of time learning those stuff and I listen to it and I can see the playing is a little bit shambolic in parts it's not great the playing is not great I think it just starts sort of I start feeling a bit detached from it because I'm like well you know it sounds a bit amateurish and I know it's again I understand that this is heavy criticism you know ultimately they wrote those songs but it's a bit like you know I feel a bit like the Beatles the Beatles wrote great songs but they'd be the first ones to say that they weren't the greatest musicians and I can sort of get that and I do enjoy listening to musicianship on album and again musicianship doesn't mean somebody that it doesn't mean tech death doesn't mean super technical musicians musicianship means you know Pink Floyd that's a very that's a band with great musicianship uh, and I just feel with Metallica I'm not getting that even live it's it's still haphazard a little bit they're playing it's not where it needs to be for the kind of music they're playing so hence I don't listen to them anymore final one and this this is the one I was saying when I was saying I'm not really proud of this of saying this but I think it's important to get it out in the open and if you've seen one of my previous videos you might have guessed this one the one band I actually cannot listen to and cannot go and see live is Iron Maiden and anybody who knows me will know how sad that is because I am I used to be the biggest Iron Maiden fan out there I was such a fan it was the first metal band I listened to I absolutely adored Iron Maiden but my biggest issue with Iron Maiden the reason I can't listen to it is Bruce Dickinson and his whole stance on Brexit absolutely killed it for me now again I don't want to go into a debate about Brexit anymore that's done and dusted people are for, people are against, it doesn't matter. Whatever chaos it's causing, it's causing it. My biggest issue with Brexit and Bruce Dickinson is when I hear his voice now, all I hear is a hypocrite. I hear somebody who took all the benefits of free freedom of movement, whose generation benefited from being able to travel so freely across you know, Europe to, 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 to play concerts, really benefited from it, and then basically voted for something that is gonna really, 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 really hamper the next generation, starting from us now. We're already struggling, the next generation gonna struggle even more. And I feel for that, to me, it's it's become an unlistenable band. Not helped by the fact that the last album, Senjutsu, was an absolute pile of dog poo. Um, it wasn't good, We've talk, I've talked about that in another video. But that is the reason that I cannot physically, and I know it sounds like, oh, you shouldn't mix you know, music and politics, I agree. Uh, to be fair, I've always said that. I don't probably says in the black metal scene, there's a lot of, you know, pseudo Nazi band. I don't really care, um, you know, because again, if you're coming with that kind of I, I, imagery in, in black metal, 
it sort of suits the imagery a little bit so I can sort of understand I don't agree with it I don't particularly listen to those bands but I have listened to some of them that are it doesn't bother me because I think it comes from certain level of honesty because if that's what you believe you believe in but with Bruce Dickinson the problem is with Brexit is that it does reek of hypocrisy completely because not only did he not only did he vote for it but then he left he moved to France to live there with his girlfriend and to me all those things make it very difficult for me to listen to Iron Maiden it's just literally I know they, they played recently I saw the set list I saw it was an amazing set list they've got recently and I just couldn't get myself to even go and see them not interested um, and it's crazy because I absolutely adored that band not till that long ago but I cannot physically listen to them anymore because every time I hear Dickinson I just get angry so I don't want to get angry all the time so anyway so that was my top five. You can see a lot of varied reasons. Couple of, couple of, you know, similar themes. The fact that you know, if you gorge on one band too much, maybe you've sort of, you know, you've sort of killed that band for yourself a little bit. If you, it's a bit like a magic trick, right? Once you've understood the magic trick, maybe it becomes a bit repetitive. Uh, there's an element of not being able to follow the musical direction a band's gone in. I can, you know, that that happens a lot. So then you sort of switch off a little bit from that band and gradually you sort of you know could move away from that band and go to other stuff it's a very common thing uh with some bands you do that but you still come back to them happily for instance queen is still one of my go-to bands uh but you know so anyway tell me about the bands that you're that, that you've got off like this like you know you used to absolutely worship and now you're like i can't listen to them anymore because it'd be quite interesting to hear that Look, I, I've, I've given my opinions about things. You may or may not agree with it. Stay polite. I mean, this is just, you know, for fun a little bit. And I've given my reasons why I don't like them. But anyway, that was it for today. A lot of rambling ons. Until next time, stay safe and stay metal.